plan today is putting together the financials for your business plan. Okay? Um, for those of you who were here last week, um, I really emphasized that the financial um, part of the business plan is really important because that tells the quantitative story of your business proposition. So you may have a lot of narrative up front okay, in your business plan. You may have a great marketing strategy. You may have done a lot of research about the industry and your competitors. But if the numbers don't translate bad information and tell a compelling story to your investors, then your business plan is not going to sell. Okay, so it's all about the numbers. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the building blocks for your numbers and how you would start to think about structuring the financial uh, part of the business plan. Okay, so let me get a sense of um, how many people here feel comfortable with accounting? A couple of people. How many people here feel comfortable with numbers? Just numbers. Okay. All right. So you can. You feel comfortable adding, you feel comfortable with a spreadsheet, okay? All right, good. Um, so, given that not many of you feel comfortable with accounting, we're gonna walk through um, some of the basics in accounting pretty slowly. Um, this is not an introductory accounting class, but I will revisit some of the accounting concepts that you might have come across in your um, basic introductory accounting class. But the one thing that you will, you will not have learned in your basic accounting class is how do you uh, put together a set of financials for a company that doesn't really exist yet, right? So what you've learned in your basic accounting class is doing about, you know, you, you're learning about debits and credits and you're learning how to do the records for a company that already exists, okay? So here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and use the, ba the basic building blocks that we learned in accounting, basic accounting, and we're going to try and use those numbers, the basic principles and the numbers to try and extrapolate into the future to tell the story about your company and why anyone would want to invest in your company. Okay? Um, I guess I haven't introduced myself, have I? No. Okay. So I'm Christine Tan. You might have read the, the sort of the invitation for tonight. Um, uh, I used to be a professor here, but I take a leave of absence. I'm now at the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Um, we basically you know, set the accounting rules for all companies in the US. So whatever I say tonight about accounting does not reflect any of the views or opinions of the board members, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, or the staff members, okay? Um, so I just need to put that caveat out there. Okay, so you've got some basic financial statements that you need to think about and that you need to include in your business plan. The first is the income statement, okay? The second is the statement of cash flow, and the third is the balance sheet. So these are the three basic financial statements that you need to, you must include in your business plan. The, the takeaway from this is that all of these financial statements are linked together. So when you start thinking about numbers, and you start thinking about numbers in one particular financial statement, like say the income statement, you need to start thinking about, well, how do the numbers in the income statement impact the statement of cash flows? And how does that impact the balance sheet? Because the numbers are all interrelated. And if the numbers are slightly off in the statement of cash flows, right, based on your numbers in the income statement, then your investor, the potential investor is going to ask you questions. It's going to say, he or she will say, the numbers don't make sense because the numbers aren't tied. Okay? So the key thing to remember is you've got these three financial statements and they're all intricately uh, linked together. So what is the income statement? The income statement basically gives you an idea of how the company has performed during the period. And when I say performed, I mean profit, right? Okay, so um, profit being revenues minus expenses. And then the statement of cash flows. Well, what does the statement of cash flow articulate? It articulates cash coming in and cash going out. That's what the statement of cash flow does. It describes the cash coming in during the period and the cash going out during the period. So some of you might ask yourself, well, what is the difference between the income statement of profit and cash coming, coming in, cash going out? Aren't they the same thing? Well, from an accounting perspective, 
they're two very, very different things. Okay? One thing to keep in mind is that the income statement captures cash coming in and some other resources coming in that does not necessarily translate into cash. That's part of your revenue. So when you think about you know, daily transactions, right? How many times do you go to the store that you buy things on credit? Pretty much all the time, right? So that doesn't necessarily translate to a cash transaction at that point in time. But the business will record that as revenue. And that revenue is included in its calculation of profit. Okay? So in that example that I just illustrated, there is a big distinction between the income statement and the statement of cash flows. It is possible for you to make a profit but have negative cash. In other words, you may have a profit on the income statement, but you may have more cash going out than cash coming in this period. It's very possible. Okay? So that's something that you have to keep in mind. And we'll, as we go through, um, as we walk through the steps today, you'll start to see the, uh, the distinction between the income statement and the statement of cash flows. Okay, so cash, um, cash coming in, cash going out. So obviously you have net cash coming in during the period. That's a good thing, right? That's what you want. Um, the balance sheet. What does the balance sheet tell us about a company? The balance sheet basically tells us what the company has in terms of assets and liabilities. Okay? It also tells us what investment the owner has in the company, the extent of uh, ownership. Okay? So the balance sheet is, gives you a snapshot of the company's position at one point in time. Now feel free to stop me at any point in time if you have any questions or if I'm going too quickly. Okay, so in terms of thinking about your financial statements now, you need to start thinking about, well, what is your business plan? What is your business proposition? What industry are you working in, right? Are you gonna be in, um, you know, is it gonna be web-based? Are you gonna be selling a product? Are you gonna be selling a service? And the reason why I'm asking you to think about that is because depending on which particular industry you're in, your financial statement will look very different. Okay, so a company's financial statement, a company that is uh, web-based that it, and, and it derives most of its revenues from subscriptions, okay, that income statement is going to look very different to a company that is going to be um, you know, baking goods and selling the goods to its customers. Okay? So thinking about the type of um, financial, uh, type of business that you're in um, will impact what your financial statement will look like. Um, the, the next part is, well, once you've, you've thought about, okay, I'm in this particular industry and this is what I expect my financial statements to look like, then you need to start thinking about your, the types of revenues and expenses and cash flows okay, that are going to be associated with, to, uh, with a particular, you know, with, with uh, a typical company in your industry. So, for instance, if you are a web-based company, you may not have a lot of um, equipment that you need, right? Okay. Um, versus if you were a company and you were making things, you were baking products or you were making things, then you may need equipment, you may need more inventory. Okay. So again, depending on what type of business you're in, Okay? Um, that's going to translate to the types of revenues that you might expect to incur in expenses and the types of cash flows. Okay, so key factors for the income statement. So revenue drivers. This is really important. You need to start thinking about what, uh, what is it that you're going to be generating. Okay? So one of the key drivers of your revenue is it, um, is it click-throughs. Is it going to be the number of... of um, products that you sell? Is it the number of hours that you spend? Okay, is that going to be the driver of your revenue? Um, once you start thinking about that, then you need to start thinking about, okay, let's say that you're, you are in a service-based industry and that the driver of revenue is the number of hours that you and your employees will spend. Okay? Then you have to ask yourself, well, how do you estimate the revenues one year ahead, two years ahead, or even for the next 12 months? So you need to start planning how you may 
try to get those numbers. You need to think about, well, how many hours do I need to spend to, to derive revenues in the future? How many hours do my employees um, have to work, right, in order for me to get a certain number, a certain dollar amount in terms of revenues? And the key part to the business plan is, as you start thinking about what are the key drivers of your revenue, and how you start estimating those revenues, you should jot those assumptions down. Because in the business plan competition, right, you need to be able to justify your assumptions. If you're gonna say, I'm gonna work you know, 24 hours a day to get this dollar of revenue, someone's gonna say, well, that doesn't really make sense. That's not possible. So you, know, you have to be able to justify your assumptions. Okay? So another way to think about that problem is, you say, okay, in, at the end of this month, at the end of you know um, this year, I want to have you know one million dollars worth of revenue. Okay, and if you're a service-based company, you've got one million dollars worth of revenue. Then you work out what how many hours working hours are there in the day? How many you know working days are there in a year? Right, and then you figure out do the working hours translate to the one million dollar revenue? Does it make sense? You have to do some mathematical gymnastics there to figure out to be able to justify why is it that you are predicting that you are estimating that you're going to generate one million dollars in revenue at the end of this year. Okay. Um, the next point: accrual versus cash-based um, revenue. This is really important because this comes back to um, the, key, the first point: the drivers of revenue. Okay, and also. Um, more, more specifically, the, the type of industry that you're in. Now, if you're, if you're in an industry where basically you are, um, you know, you're selling a service and you're charging people up front for the service, or you're, you're um, you know, selling a service and then right at the end of, after you complete providing the service, you, you, you receive cash, or is it that you give your customers or your clients a um, 30-day window to pay you, all of that matters in terms of how you record your revenue and when you record your cash. Okay. Um, so the difference between accrual-based concept of revenue and cash-based is that the accrual-based concept of revenue is the revenue number that we report in the income statement. That's essentially, you know, this is basic accounting 101. The accrual-based accrual -based, uh, concept of revenue is the revenue number in your income statement. So as I said before, there's a big difference between income statement and the statement of cash flows. The income statement reports performance for the company, so profits, revenues, minus expenses, right? And the revenues in the income statement includes cash revenues as well as non-cash revenues. So it's the non-cash that's the accrual, okay? So in the income statement, the revenues includes cash and non-cash revenues, and in the cash flow statement, it's only cash, whatever comes in that period. Okay, so the cash flow is really, you know, more of a cash basis of accounting, right? And the perspective of the revenue is more cash based. Um, so, for for a company that basically deals only in cash, right? You sell to your customers, you collect cash at the point of sale, you pay your suppliers with cash, they don't give you credit, then in that particular instance, you, your income statement is going to look pretty much like your statement of cash flows, because you will not have a lot of non-cash transactions. Okay. Um, now, the next part is really important as well, earned versus realized. Now, these are like buzzwords I'm throwing out, so you know, it's, and if you've done your basic accounting class, you will be very familiar with that. I'm sure your accounting professors have really drawn that into you, right? So, under the accrual basis of accounting, so in your income statement, the revenue is recorded when it's earned and when it's realizable. Okay, so again, when you are putting your income statement together and you have to think about your revenue number, you have to think about the revenue number in terms of have I earned that revenue and is it realizable? So let me give you an example, simple example. You're in an industry where you're selling a subscription basis. It's a subscription, right? You are selling content, okay? And um, 
And let's say you know you, you are offering your customers a one-year subscription. And then every month they get to read your website and they get something from your newsletter, magazine, something. So your customer gives you $120 up front. So when you receive the $120 up front, okay, the question is, do you record all of that as revenue? Well, under the accrual concept of accounting, that $120 is not revenue, right? In fact, it's a liability. Because when you get the $120 at the beginning of that one year, you owe your customer 12 months worth of content. Now, as you go through each month and as you deliver the content to your customer, then you are earning that $120 or a portion thereof. And so as you earn a portion of that $120, that portion that you earn as you deliver your content becomes revenue. That's the revenue number that appears in your income statement. Okay. Now, um, I'll, I'll go through this when we actually look at the Excel spreadsheet so you can start thinking about how to, how to put those numbers into your Excel spreadsheet. Okay, as you put your income statement together. But that's, that's how you should be thinking about revenues, okay? Have you earned that revenue and is it realizable? Well, in that, in that example, is it realizable? Well, you have $120 in your pocket, right, from the customer. So, of course, it's realizable. You've got it. What's more tricky in some cases for some of you that have businesses where you, um, you may have, um, uh, you know, earned some revenue but not collected the cash. This is where it becomes tricky. So some of your business models may involve situations where you provide some sort of service to your customer and then you give them some time to pay you later on. And that's plausible, right? You give them a 30-day period um, for them to pay you. Now when you come back to this whole situation of do I record that as revenue? Well, have you earned that revenue? You have received cash. Just because you haven't received cash doesn't mean you can't record revenue, right? So you need to think about when can I record revenue? I can record revenue when I earned it. Have you delivered the content? Yes, I have. Have you realized that this is where it becomes tricky? It could be possible that your customer may not pay you, right? There's a probability that your customer may not pay you. In most cases, you're going to provide content or you're going to provide a service or a good to your customer when you think that there's a good chance that they'll pay you, otherwise you wouldn't be selling to them, right? But there's always that slight chance, okay? So when you think about um, your different business models and if it does, if your business model calls for providing content up front and then, you know, your customer pays you at some period of time thereafter, then you need to start thinking about collectability and whether or not you can realize or what portion of that you may have to write off may not be realizable. What portion of that may actually not be revenue, okay? Okay, so that's revenues. Are there any questions about revenues? So there's some basic concepts for revenues? Yep. Just a simple point. Since a business model or business plan is based on assumptions, that's an assumption. Come up with a sales model or a sponsor. The problem for that reason, usually, usually something helps you on there are some business models and some modern software that help you walk through that process. Okay. Once you find your business. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I mean, this is a business plan that you're putting together that's going to be looked at by, um, you know, sophisticated investors and people who are very familiar with business plans. And so, if you have a software, so the question up front was, well, we have software tools that basically automate. I don't want to use the word automate, but kind of help, makes it easy for you to come up with the numbers. But at the end of the day, when you come up with those numbers, you have to be able to justify how you got those numbers. And so when you think about how you got those numbers, revenues, I, you know, I, I recognize revenues um, of $10,000 for the month of January. Well, that revenue number, $10,000 for the month of January, is a function of many things. It's a function of how much of that collected, how much of that you haven't collected, right? Um, it's, it's a function of how many hours you might have put in, it's a function of 
function of, you know, um, who, you know, uh, what you sold. So it, it, it's 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 a function of many variables that you have to justify, you know, those those assumptions. And so, especially when you're trying to show growth in your revenue, you have to be able to justify growth rates in your revenue and, and what factors play into those growth rates. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Also, the number of customers is uncertain. The number Even of customers. You can also make an assumption. So that is, I think, the most difficult thing to determine. How do you determine how many clients you can get from which kind of uh, criteria? So that that that's how. Um, so so now you can start to see. Um, you know, the the first part of your business plan, you're going to be doing your market. Research. You're going to be looking at your industry. You're going to be looking at your competitors. You're going to be, you know, getting a sense for that. So now all of that information that you did up front in the business plan has to somehow trickle into how you come up with these numbers. So you could say, for instance, based on your research, that conservatively, I would expect ten. I would expect to sell to ten customers a week. Aggressively. Based on my research, I estimate maybe 20 customers a week. Take the average, 15 customers. So when you start building out your income statement, you may want to think about sensitivity analysis. So in other words, and this is kind of, you know, again, it makes it more complicated, but you may want to have an income statement for a conservative estimate, come up with an income statement for an aggressive estimate, and then come up for an, in for an income statement that is probably you know, in, in between the average, what you think. So that, again, gives the investor, when an investor looks at your income statement, it gives them an idea of what, you know, what boundaries, what parameters they're looking at. Okay, yep. When you do sensitivity analysis, typically what's the margin of, between the high, middle, and low, uh, in terms of percentage points? It's really hard to say. I think it, it, really, it really varies. So, you know, again, um, you may you may want to so to, to give you some ideas you know you may want to look at um, for your industry you may say okay I did an analysis of the industry over the past five years okay the growth rate was on average say ten percent okay and then you think well you know I think it's going to grow over the next ten you know five years I think it's going to be fifteen percent so your ten percent would be your kind of baseline okay. And then your 15% because what you what you estimate other you know other um, things that you might have included in your analysis you come up with an, uh, an assumption that you know I, I believe that the industry is going to grow 15% and then you might want to come up with a worst case scenario you know at worst case it might be five percent so again it's, it's this is really you know it's um it's not a science it's 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 an it's a guesstimate. But the thing is, as long as you can provide good reasoning for your guesstimates, right, for your assumptions, then, and, and as long as you can defend those assumptions, then it's, it, there's no right or wrong answer, right? The investor will get either believe your assumptions or not believe your assumptions to come up with the numbers. But you have to be able to justify your assumptions. The worst situation to be in is to provide these numbers and say, oh, I think this is going to grow, you know, 30%, and then when you're, when someone, you know, when, when you're the investors said, well, on what basis are you coming up with that 30% growth rate, and if you can't justify that, then that's the end of, the, you know, of your pitch, basically. Okay. Any other questions? All right, uh, cost of goods sold. So this is where, um, for those of you who are in industries where you are selling something, Okay, you have to pay attention to the cost of goods sold because the cost of goods sold is the cost that you incur in buying that good that you are selling. That's what cost of goods sold represents. It's an expense, okay? And it's an expense when you sell something. But before you sell that inventory, that item, it's not an expense, it's an asset. So basic accounting, right? Everything is an asset, well not everything, but um, you know, inventory is an asset until you sell it. When you sell it, that inventory becomes an expense. Kind of seems a little bit uh, not intuitive if you're not familiar with accounting. But a um, good example is if you're trying to wrap your head around cost of goods sold. Very simple example. Let's say you're in the business of buying and selling textbooks, secondhand textbooks. You buy a textbook for ten dollars. 
you sell for fifteen dollars. What's your profit? Fifteen minus ten, five dollars. Your revenue in this example is fifteen dollars. Your cost of goods sold is ten dollars, right? The cost of the good that you sold. That's what it is. So it's an expense. But if you don't sell that textbook, it's not an expense. It's an asset because that textbook you can sell it next period or next month. Okay, so an asset is anything that gives rise to a future benefit. So that's how we think about cost of goods sold. Other things that you may want to think about are variable costs, like selling expenses. So these are when we say variable costs, we mean that you know costs that vary um, with your sales. Okay. Um, so the more you sell, okay, the more costs you're going to incur for selling expenses. Um, the more you sell, the more costs you may have to incur for um, you know your marketing or your advertising. The next thing is financing costs, interest expense. So basically any um, cost that you incur because you are borrowing, whether it's from the bank or from uh, families and friends, um, they may charge you interest, so that's a financing cost. So when we start thinking about you know, um, operations and financing um, and investing, uh, you need to start classifying these expenses um, and revenues into the categories, operating and financing and investing. Okay? Um, they're, they're very distinct uh, categories, okay? And most people are going to pay attention to the operating revenues and the operating expenses because the operating revenues and operating expenses tell you about the, the performance from an operational point of view, okay? And that's what investors are interested in. If you are showing good operating profits, that means you're doing really well operating your business. You may be able to mask uh, bad operating performance by borrowing um, you know borrowing um, or, or raising more funds okay um, and, and trying to um, you know then use the funds and you put it in the bank to earn interest and that becomes interest revenue and, and it helps with the, the bottom line the income number people don't buy that right so they, they can tell the difference between Revenues from operations and revenues not from operations that influence your bottom line net income number. Okay, your net income number is the grand total, your grand profit number. The operating profit, um, the financing profit, the investing profit all rolls up into your big total net income. Okay, so um, when you start thinking about um, your income statement that way, I think it helps to to really focus on what really is important for your business. Okay, um, so some other things I wanted to sort of throw out there before we get into the nuts and bolts is you've got your fixed costs. So we talked about variable costs, now we're going to talk about fixed costs. Some of you may have questions like, well, okay, I'm, it's going to cost me a lot to start up this business. I'm going to have to buy computers, I'm going to have to buy some, you know, I, might, I may have to buy a car, I may have to uh, buy some equipment. And how do I account for these expenditures? Well, these are what we call fixed costs. And I'm going to focus on depreciation for the moment, and then I'll go back to your rent. Um, if you're in that situation, then um, the great thing about accounting is that you get to spread those costs over a period of time. So even though your bank balance may be feeling the pitch of buying all the computers up front and buying the car up front, buying the equipment up front, from an accounting perspective, all of that cash going out to you know, the various suppliers up, up front does not translate to expenses up front. Okay? So when we say depreciation, all we're simply doing is allocating the cost of that computer over a period of time. So one way to think about depreciation is this. You buy a computer for your business, $3,000. You think that the computer is going to be useful to you over a three-year period. You're going to use that computer over the three-year period to run your business. So what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, if I pay $3,000 for this computer, I think it's going to last me three years, which is reasonable, right? Then I would expense $1,000 of that computer each period or each year and call that an expense. So only $1,000 of that computer is an expense in that one year. Not $2,000, not $3,000, but $1,000.
And then the next year comes around. You're going to expense the other 1,000. And that becomes expense. And then the final year comes around when your, your computer is pretty much about to break down, right? You're going to say, okay, $1,000, that's an expense. So at the end of the three years, the computer is no longer useful to you. It's not an asset, so it doesn't appear in your balance sheet. And all of that has been allocated to expense over the three-year period. So that's how we think about depreciation. So when you think about any of the big assets or big items that you have to pay up front to start your business, start thinking about, one thing is start thinking about over what period of time will you be using these assets. And then you apportion it that way, and that portion to each period becomes an expense. Okay, yep. Uh, I think I have the wrong understanding, and uh, maybe what you just said is going to help me turn it around. I thought that when you buy the computer 3000 it's deductible the first year, so you write off the 3000 the first year, and then you allocate for three years like a sort of a provisional amount so that you can replace it. Right. So, yeah. The way to think about depreciation is depreciation, again, it goes back to a very basic concept. Assets, all assets become expenses. It's just a question of when, right? So the basic idea is, is a computer an asset to you? Yes, it is. It's an asset. Is a car an asset to you? Yes, it is. It's an asset. We all think about those things as assets, right? It's an asset because it gives you a future benefit. You get to use it to run your business, okay? So the idea about an asset becoming an expense may seem very odd to some people, but it really makes sense. Let's say you have an asset computer that you get to use, right? And the link between asset and expense is very simple. It's this. You're going to use 33.3% of your asset in one year, which is the example I gave you, the computer, three-year period. At the end of the first year, you use one-third of it. So you've used one-third of your asset. Well, when you've consumed or used up one third of your asset or one third of your resource, well, where does that consumption go? It goes to expense, okay? So depreciation is just simply a way of allocating a portion of the asset that you have used up or consumed to expense. And the reason why it becomes expense is because then it's reflected, right, in your performance of the company. If you are consuming more resources than you are generating revenues, then it's a bad thing, right? Then you have a net loss, okay? So that's how we think about appreciation. It's got nothing to do with, well, I, I think you might be alluding to like, when you say, whenever you say deduction, I think of taxes. So this is nothing to do with taxes. That, that's a completely separate issue. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Where do you go find the, the depreciation time frame? Is there a kind of like a standard table? That, that's a great question. Um, the, it, it really, really has There is no hard and fast rule for depreciation, the useful life. And this is another thing that you, another assumption that you have to make. I made an assumption. The computer is going to last me three years. Now, someone else would come along and say, the computer is going to last me five years. And then a potential investor is going to look at that and say, yeah, I don't buy that. So, and your numbers may be based on the assumption of a useful life of five years. Again, the investor may have questions about that. This is where assumptions are important, right? So to answer your question, the best way to get a sense of useful life of assets is to look at other companies and if you can get your hands on there, you know, if, 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 again, it's hard to say because you're mostly going to be in private, you know, your competitors will be private companies, so you may not be able to get financial statements from them. But, um, you know, if, if let's say if, if your company is, um, you know, if, if your company, say, is in, you know, media, you may want to just take a look at the financial statements of a media company that's publicly, you know, that's publicly listed and have a look at the depreciation, how, you know, they may have something in the footnotes that discusses depreciation. Um, they may have a little table that shows you the useful one, and you can get a sense from that. Um, another, another way is, you know, you can look at the tax code. The tax code does have very strict depreciation schedules, but that's for tax purposes. Again, you can kind of use that as a benchmark to get a sense of certain categories of assets, how you would depreciate, what is the useful life. Any other questions? Yeah. Conceptual question. If you go back <coughs> to the slide, under the variable cost, you have a, a marketing and advertising. Is this way I hire somebody to do an advertising campaign, and the advertising campaign is flopped, so there's no variable 
revenues were being generated from that cost. Yeah, that, that, that's a, yeah then that's a, uh, a sunk cost. So to a less cost. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the way we think about variable costs is that it's going to vary with your sales. Yeah. The more you sell, the more of the cost that you're going to incur. So if you have, you know, obviously if you're paying your, if you have a salesperson and you're paying them eight percentage of their sales, then that's obviously a variable cost. Um, rent expense, that's going to be fixed, obviously, salaries, fixed, general administrative expenses like, you know, um, insurance, okay, um, utilities, etc. And other fixed costs, um, as I said, insurance, capital expenditures, product development. So, like product development, meaning research and development, okay, R&D. Yeah. Salaries, you get their uh, commission based? Or no, then, then it's commission based, then I would put that as um, more of a salary expense and, and variable cost. Yeah. I'm here, yeah, I'm thinking more, you know, fixed, yeah, salaries. Okay, so, um, so going back to the, what I started off with, uh, think about how the financial statements interact with each other. And you might say to yourself, well, where do I start? Especially if you're not feeling comfortable with accounting, where do I start? I'm telling you, you should start always with the income statement. You get your income statement right. The rest, if you are following your basic accounting textbook properly, should fall together. Okay, it should logically come together. But the key is to get your income statement right, which is why I've been emphasizing the income statement, revenues and expenses. And you'll start to see why later on when I go into the spreadsheet. So the punch, the, what's the takeaway here? Get your income statement right, okay? When you get your income statement right, when you know, when you when you have to estimate your future revenues and you feel comfortable with the future revenues that you've estimated, then all of that will translate to cash flows. Okay? Um, think about your expenses. When you get your expenses correct, then that will, that will naturally translate to your cash flows. So here is an example. Let me just flip, out, flip over from here to the spreadsheet. Okay, so here's a, 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 a you know um, your basic income statement. You've got your revenues. You've got um, so you've got your revenues. You've got your cost of goods sold, your cost of sales, and then you have all of your um, your fixed expenses. Okay, so you've got salaries, expense, payroll, um, you know, advertising, telephone rent, depreciation, and other expenses, etc. And then you have your bottom line income. So this is a very, very simple net income, uh, income statement, okay? Now, notice that I, in, in this example, the income statement, you have your different revenues. You've got your category one, two, and three. So the revenues are being split out into different product lines or different service services, okay? So this is where you need to think about. This number that I put here, and I just made these numbers up, I just stuck these numbers in here. I said category one, in January, I expect to generate $150,000 in revenues. Now, the assumptions that go into the $150,000 could be very different to the number I would come up with for Category 2 in January. Because this is where you need to think about what different product lines do you have, okay? Um, and what are the drivers of those product lines? Like, what am I, what am I selling? How am I going to come up with $150,000? The number of hours. So in, in January, I had, you know, um, uh, I $100,000. So I, I, you know, I worked $150, uh, 150 hours. I charge out $1,000, right? My team charges out $1,000. And um, we worked 150 hours. Category two. Well, we, we sell, you know, we, we can sell, but we also sell product. We sell software. So how many... Packages, software packages did I sell in January to come up with a number for January? So the point I'm getting here is that think about your revenue streams and what goes into uh, determining those revenue streams. What are the estimates? Is it a number of click-throughs? Is it a number of hours worked? Is it a number of products sold? Okay? So that will, um, you need to be able to provide some detail. Now, of course, at the income statement level, you don't need to provide all the assumptions, you shouldn't be providing those assumptions in this income statement. You don't want to clutter it up. But in your footnotes to this income statement, you should be saying, this $150,000 is based on X number of hours worked, 
times the charge out rate per hour. For product two, or category two, that number is based on X number of products sold, okay, at the sales unit price. Okay? Number three, again, a different product, number of products sold times a different sales price per unit. So all of those assumptions have to be in the background and it has to be shown to the investor if they have questions, right? They can go and look further and, and dig into that. So you can start to see. You need to think about for each month, but then you need to think about, well, how do I come up with a number for next month for $200,000? Well, because next month we hired someone else on the team and they, would have, they were able to put in an additional um, you know, 50 hours work over that month. That's how we got the $200,000. Okay, so you need to start thinking about your growth, okay? How you expect the revenues to, to grow over that period of time. Now, I'm showing you an income statement on a monthly basis, and that's what's expected of you for the business plan. The first year, because investors want to know <coughs> how you're going to be performing on a monthly basis, okay? And it's okay if you have zero revenues for the first six months and you have a whole bunch of expenses down here, and then you start showing revenues for the, the, the second <laughs> month. Again, you need to, I mean, if it's your particular business and that's the way it is because you have a whole bunch of expenses up front in the first six months to get it up and going and you won't be generating revenue until the latter half of the year, that has to be reflected in your income statement. Okay? All right, so you've got your revenues. Um, you've got your cost of sales again. This is where you need to think about how the cost of goods sold, right, for your category one translates and how that is correlated with your revenues from your category one. It has to make sense, right? Someone looking at an income statement where you come up with numbers for your cost of goods sold and you've got your sales going up but your cost of goods sold going down, some investors are going to say, well, that doesn't make sense. The numbers don't make sense. Your cost of sales should vary according to your revenues. If your revenues are going up by from month to month, it's going up by five percent, but your cost of sales is not going up by five percent. What are you? What are you saying? So you need to think about the numbers, how they are connected to each other. Basic relationship: cost of sales is directly related to your sales revenue. Okay. Unless, of course, you know, the more you sell, you may get some discounts from your inventory that you buy from your suppliers. That may be reflected in your cost of sales, so that may not be a perfect correlation between cost of sales and revenues. But again, you have to be able to justify that and provide that detail to the investor, right? Okay? Don't just make the numbers up, throw them in there, and then wave your hands, right? You have to be able to justify the numbers. Okay, so you've got your cost of sales. Then the rest are fairly straightforward, salaries, right? So you've got your salaries per, per month, You'd expect that to be fairly stable, unless of course you're hiring more people, so that's gonna, you're gonna show that which month you plan to hire more people, yep. When, I've seen people put R&D into class of so, um, is it industry specific, is it? Yeah, what? it's industry specific. And yeah, it's industry. industry specific, and let me um, back up and say, you know, uh, unlike the um, unlike publicly listed companies who have to comply with the rules that we write the BASB, right? This business plan, it's really you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you can justify. It. Now, if for instance, if you are making a product, right, and you are not buying a product and selling that product, you are making that product. Think about it. You are putting money into investing into developing this product. That money that you are putting into investing into this product needs to be allocated over the number of products that you sell, the number of units that you sell. So that's how the R&D gets factored into the cost of sales. But if you're not um, developing this product, you're simply buying and selling a, an existing product, and you may be spending some money on developing some new products that are not related to the products that you're currently buying and selling, in that case, the R&D expenses should not be part of the cost of sales. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But it's kind of hard though. Sorry? It's, it's, it's difficult to separate correct R&D versus um, future, right? 
because Sorry. you have you have a team, especially if you're doing software, um, you may have one engineer who writing code for one product that you're selling today and code for product that you're selling later. So due to um, time based, then, how then many hours they spend on each product? Think, I mean, it, it, the, the, the modification I made before was that you are you are buying a, a finished product and selling a finished product, right? As opposed to you know, you are making a product in house and then selling them. So, if what you're saying is you have two or three engineers that are building different software packages, then you would have to trace. You know, if you again, if you want to get into the details, um, you would have to trace how many hours they put in, and you know, if you want to classify the you know the, the time that they spend and put that as part of the R and D, or you can simply call it wages expense. But if you want to put it as R and D, then that's how you would do it. And then put it through cost of sales when you actually have a product that they've developed that you can sell. Yeah. If if you're in, in a service business, and, and let's say you have a contract, and let's say the contract is going to generate a uh, hundred thousand dollars in revenue for a twenty-four month period, mm -hmm. and and you have attorneys' fees at the beginning of the contract, and the attorneys' fees are a hundred thousand dollars. Would you take those that hundred thousand dollars and divide it over the twenty-four months of revenue allocated, or would you expense it when when it actually got paid? Um, so I'm trying to understand your question. So you've got a contract that's to provide a service, yep. consulting services, and, and, and hundred thousand dollars for two-year period. So two point four million dollars in revenue. Okay, two point four million. My my legal fees, let's say, relating to that contract, yep. are hundred thousand dollars. Do do I expense that? When I pay it, or do I allocate it over? The yeah, okay, Here, here's one basic sort of principle in, in a cool accounting, the matching principle, right? Mm -hmm. So in that example that I, I went through before about, you know, how do you record revenues when in the income statement is when you earn and you realize it. So in your example, you get $2.4 million from your client up front, right? Well, no, let's say, let's say it's 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 being allocated. I'm not talking about the revenue side. I'm, I'm actually interested okay. in, in, in the legal fees. Uh, so, how, how much are you in the month? If the expenses are directly correlated to that particular contract, then you would expense it over... Over the 24 months. Over the 24 months, okay, yeah. Good. Because right. you're matching your expenses to your revenues, which is the basic concept, revenues minus expenses equals your profit. So the matching principle is actually really important, um, and let me articulate that in very simple terms. You know, revenues minus expenses equals profit, right? And so your expenses that you incur have to be matched to your revenues. So you need to think about your matching principle. Did I incur this expense to generate revenues this period? If you did, then you need to recognize the expense this period and recognize the revenue in the same period. What you don't want to do is recognize an expense that you incur this period to generate revenues this period, recognize that expense next period or last period. Because then your revenue, your income number for all the three periods or you know over the two periods is going to be wrong. What's your income? Revenues minus expenses. So when you think about the matching principle, you have to think about the expenses incurred in order to generate revenue. And that, it's as simple as it gets. Okay. Um, so you've got all of your other expenses that you have to think about and list through and then these are fixed, so you would expect them unless there's a structural change in your expenses. Um, you know, maybe um, you may have, um, you know, you're, you, you, you may have a huge expense. If, if you are in, in, in retail, you may have a huge advertising expense around, you know, October and November for the, the holiday period. So, you know, there may be a structural shift. But overall, you'd expect these expenses to be fairly stable across the period. Okay, so let me now turn, to, so we're not an income statement, we're going to look at the statement of cash flows. This is where it gets really tricky. Notice that we spend a lot of time on the income statement, I didn't even talk about cash flows yet. But once you get the income statement down and you look at the numbers over the 12 month period and you're comfortable with that, then you should start thinking about the statement of cash flows. That's the next step. Don't start with the statement of cash flows at first and then back it out and work on the income statement. The reason is this. Let me just quickly go through this, what the statement of cash flow looks like, and then we'll talk about the computation of these numbers in the statement of cash flows. So the statement of cash flows, you have your cash receipts, all the cash coming in. So you've got your cash sales, you've got your credit, uh, sorry, not credit sales. You've got your cash sales, you've got your other cash coming in, collections from accounts receivable, okay? 
um, and then you have cash going out. So cash going out, um, you know, purchases, gross wages, payroll, etc. Right? And then you have the subtotal. And then you have here is where you sort of take out all of your other your non-operating cash items. You're going to put them in a separate category because again, it's good to isolate cash from operations and cash from other activities not associated with your core activities, your core operations. Okay, because investors are going to be interested in from your core business, what does your cash flow look like? That's what they're going to focus on, right? Okay. So I've got this up here because um, this is I like to think of, of um, uh, okay the, we start with a simple example. This is where I'm gonna, you know, you can start to see how the financial things all are linked together. Think about revenues, okay, from your income statement. In this example, we said, okay, in the month of January, I expected to generate $150,000 in revenues. Okay, the $150,000 could all be cash revenue, or half of that could be collected in cash, so cash sale, and half of that was on credit. And again, remember, just because you didn't collect cash doesn't mean you can't record it as revenue in your income statement. Okay? So in this case, January, we had $150,000 in revenues. Now you need to start thinking about, well, how much of that is actually cash that I received in January? Now in your particular, this is where you need to do your research for your industry. Is it the norm in your industry that it's all cash sales? So if you're a coffee shop, then of course it's cash, right? Okay. Um, but if you are, if you are, let's say, um, what's a business that may have Sorry? A distributor where you're selling credit. Okay. So you may distribute wines. My favorite topic. <laughs> so you may distribute wines where, you know, 50% of that could be on credit. You've distributed the wines. They have 30 days to pay you. Percent of that could be cash. You deliver the wines, they pay you cash right there and then. Simple example. But that's where you need to think about the, the, the balance, right? What's the norm for your business? Okay? That's tricky. That takes a lot of research and, and thinking about it. Again, you might want to think of sensitivity analysis. Worst case scenario, best case scenario, what's the average? And this is where it plays into the statement of cash flows. You say, okay. Out of the $150,000 that I recorded in my revenues, uh, in my income statement, I'm going to say, well, in, in January, I'm going to collect, well, all, half of that would be cash sales. So the $75,000 of half of that is $75,000. So that's cash that I collect in January at the point of sale. Which means that that's $75,000 that you have not yet collected, right? And in accounting, what do we call that? We call that an account receivable, right? What's an account receivable? It's a balance sheet account. It appears in your balance sheet. So now you can start to see whatever number you come up with in your income statement impacts your statement of cash flow and it impacts your balance sheet, right? The numbers have to somehow tie. Now, if you said that you would generate revenues of 100 thousand dollars in your income statement which is what we have here for January right and your based on your assumptions you say half of that is cash that means at the end of the period um, and you start off with hundred thousand dollars in the bank you would have total cash of hundred and seventy five dollars now you have to provide an income statement for the month of January you have to provide a statement of cash flows for the month of January and you also have to provide a balance sheet for the end of January, okay? So your balance sheet, um, this is just for, this is for at the year end, but you have, in your balance sheet, imagine you have a balance sheet that's for each month going out. So, what's the account receivable number that you put in your balance sheet at the end of January? Well, it's gotta be $75. And the reason being, you started off with zero accounts receivable because you started the business in January, right? The beginning of January, so you didn't have anything left over from the last period. So you had beginning balance of zero accounts receivable. During the period, you generated credit uh, sales 
right? So you have revenues of $75,000 that you haven't yet collected, and, and no one paid you, right, for the $75,000, okay? At the end of the accounting period, or at the end of the month, you have accounts receivable of $75,000. Okay, so that $75,000 is appears in your balance sheet at the end of January, right, for the month of January, and that $75,000 is associated with your account receivable. Okay? Now, let's look at the month of February, right? In February, I estimate that I've got revenues of $200,000. Again, let's apply the same logic. In the month of February, I have $200,000. And I say, in the month of February, half of that I collect in cash. Half of that was a cash sale. And the other half was on credit. So now you can start to see, right, the wheels are turning for accounts receivable. It's going to compound, right? So you have, at the beginning of February, you have beginning accounts receivable of what? 75000 that you carried over from last period, from January. So you expect to collect the $75,000 that you sold to your distributors on credit in January, right? You hope to collect them in February. But then, in February, you generate another $100,000 in credit sales. Then you need to think about, well, how much do you estimate to collect each period? Just because you generated, you sold on credit in January $75,000 doesn't mean that all of that $75,000 will be collected in the month of February. So you need to start thinking about the, co the collection, the pattern of collections, and what is normal for your industry. Okay. So you can start to see that it gets more complicated as you move along the months, right? You start off with your beginning account receivable of 75000 In the month of February, you have $100,000 in additional credit sales. Then you come up with some numbers. So, okay, I collect $30,000 from the $75,000 in January. So $75,000 plus $100,000 minus $30,000 equals the ending accounts receivable for the month of February is $145,000. So when you pre prepare your balance sheet for the month of February, your accounts receivable has to be $145,000 based on your revenue number in the income statement, based on your cash collected, right, in your statement of cash flows. Is there a standard for cash collections? Um, I mean, if you have a very, if you're going into a very established industry, I can understand that there would be probably a fairly standard expectation for how much you're actually going to get in account receivables every month. You know, it's that's such a hard um, thing to estimate because it's you know it, it, it's really hard um, in this day and age because people are defaulting, people can't pay their bills, and some people are stretching it out. So this is where you need to start thinking about, and, and this could be reflected in your business plan. We're focusing on customers paying you, but I haven't even talked about the income, you know, cash going out. How much you can stretch out your suppliers. They may, you may buy stuff on credit from your suppliers, and they may give you 30-day credit period. But you may take two months, three months, maybe even four months to pay your suppliers, right? So um, that all needs to be factored into the cash going out. But to answer your question. You know, it's really, really hard to come up with some formula to say, okay, again. So it's not expected to be exceptionally accurate because there's no formula. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, it comes back to, again, sensitivity, sensitivity analysis. So, you know, as I said, this is not really a science. It's, it's a science to the extent that whatever assumptions that you build into your modeling, um, and of course, math mathematics is mathematics, right? The, the numbers have to add up. The numbers have to tie that part is scientific to that extent, it's logical. But the assumptions going into getting the numbers, you know what? Wave your hand, say extreme, aggressive, conservative, in the middle. And it comes down to when you say, this is my, ex my aggressive estimate, then you have to be able to justify that with your research that you've done for the industry, for you know consumer behavior, that kind of thing. And if you're in, and it's a case that people, you know, based on your research, people in the industry pay on time, or, or it's pretty much cash sales, then then you don't have to worry about cash receivable. So it really depends on on the industry. Yeah. And again, the other thing to think about too is, you know, obviously, um, 
when you start out a business and you expect not to collect from your customers, it's probably not a good idea to start that business, right? So, uh, you know, you, you can come up with a conservative uh, worst case scenario, but you would hope that the worst case scenario is that you're not collecting on, you know, 75% of your credit. But you also probably think that it was unrealistic for you to expect to collect 100% every 30 days. Unless, well, yes. Exactly. If you were putting that in, they'd be like, well, then you're not thinking about this. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So then there's got to be some sort of, you know, uh, some buffer that you're building where you can't, you, there's, uh, there's, there's a, you know, sort of like this boundary where you can say, okay, I can work within these bounds. So the very uh, optimistic view of the world, it's a very pessimistic view of the world. This is kind of what most people are thinking right now, which is doing it in many ways. So, um, yeah. How do you, um, I guess, account for returns of products? Oh, that's a good question. Um, returns of products, um, I always get one of these questions. It, returns of products, you've got um, your revenues, you've got um, uh, revenues you can build in, a return and allowances <coughs> to get your net sales revenue. So that's, a, that's another sort of subcategory under revenues. Before you even think about cost of sales, right, there, there can be a subcategory where you may want to factor into your modeling in terms of returns and allowances when in fact products, people didn't like your baked goods, whatever, right? Um, again, this is based on whatever research that you've done, if you want to be conservative, you can factor that in. But it's a problem when that number becomes fairly large, when there's a lot of returns and you're estimating a lot of returns and allowances, and it's a good exercise, right? And if that's the case, then you probably shouldn't be doing this exercise. Yeah. Is there, uh, to that point, is there something an average as far as bad debt that you should try to account for for an average 10%? It's really hard to say. You know what you should do is um, take a look at some the big retail companies and look at their bad debt expense. Use that. I mean, if people aren't paying, you know, if, 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 if um, you know, Walmart or some of the biggest retailers are, or, you know, um, Macy's, Federated Stores, whatever, if they're having problems collecting, then you can kind of get a sense for that from that. There's a lot of information you can get from the, from the 10Ks and 10Qs of companies. It's, it's hard to kind of make an apples to apples comparison because so David and Goliath, you know, but um, it, it's, still, it's still something to work from. All right, so you can start to see that the, the key is get the income statement numbers correct, then, then it will translate to the statement of cash flows. Um, and all these numbers have to tie up, right? Tie back to your income statement. Um, the thing uh, you should think about for your balance sheet is um, a lot of, okay, so some, fu some fundamental things to think about your balance sheet. The balance sheet is basic accounting 101. Balance sheet has to balance. Assets have to equal liabilities plus your stockholders' equity. It is what it is, right? It has to balance so it. Your total assets have to equal to your liabilities. This number, <coughs> total liabilities plus total owners' equity. Okay? Now, as I said before, income statement has to tie to your statement of cash flows, and your statement of cash flows has to tie to your balance sheet. How do they tie? The statement of cash flow, right? The change in um, cash from one period to the next. So let's look at this very simple example. Your cash in the bank in year one was 120,000. Or do it January, February. Let's call it January, February. So at the end of January, your cash was 120,000. At the end of February, your cash was 150,000. Right? So think about your balance sheet for each month. If you began your month of February with $120,000 in the bank, and at the end of February you have $150,000, therefore during the month of February you have a net increase in cash of $30,000. Your statement of cash flow, cash coming in, cash going out, has to articulate a net increase of $30,000. The numbers have to add up, right? And if your cash flow statement shows that you have net cash coming in, you have cash coming in, $50,000, 
and cash going out of forty thousand dollars, and in your cat or and in your um, uh, um, your balance sheet, you've got cash that doesn't show you that net increase of thirty thousand dollars. There's a problem, right? Your investor's going to say, "What's going on here?" First and foremost, you don't know accounting. You don't you can't add up. And secondly, it, it's clear that you simply just plug the numbers in because you wanted to make your balance sheet balance. Okay? So again, it, the numbers have to tie up. You have to put a fair bit of work into that. So the, the, the one basic thing, make sure that your statement of cash flow ties up to your balance sheet, right? Your statement of your change for the cash, changing cash for the month of February articulates this difference in February, uh, January and February here, the increase in cash. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, the other thing you want to look at is um, in your retained earnings, in your, in your uh, balance sheet, your retained earnings uh, represents your profits, um, uh, the profits that you have uh, basically retained in the business. Okay, so if you had generated profits for the month of February of $50,000, and assuming you didn't pay dividends because you're a startup company, you don't pay dividends, then the $50,000 has to be reflected in your retained earnings um, as shown here. Yeah, you're showing a, a beginning retained earnings and ending retained earnings. So the $50,000 has to be shown in your ending retained earnings on the balance sheet. It's got to. So another key thing to look at, right, is the numbers from the income statement, the, income, the net income number has to tie with the retained earnings number in your balance sheet. They should be the same number. If they're not the same number, right, um, or the change in retained earnings, it's, if it's not the same number, if the change in retained earnings is not the same number as what is in your income statement for that month, then you must have paid that dividend. And your investor's gonna ask that, right? If your change in retained earnings for the month of um, uh, February is not the same as your net income for the month of February, then you must have paid that dividend. Okay, so that's another linkage that you need to think about. Okay, all right. So um, let me let me keep going. It's it's kind of getting late. Um, the the next thing and then the slides. I'll, I'm gonna make them available. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll email them to Liz and Rasia and she'll post them on the website. But as I said before, this is kind of rehashing the key points that I I spoken about. Um, in, you know, in terms of doing the calculations for the statement of cash flows doing the sensitivity analysis for optimistic, realistic, pessimistic. Um, now, I haven't really spoken about the balance sheet. I've, I've spent a lot of time on the income statement, statement of the cash flows, but the reason why I've spent a lot of time on those two is because you need to start out with a good income statement. You can see how, how when you start out with a bad income statement and the numbers don't make sense in the income statement, everything else doesn't make sense, right? Now, when you think about the balance sheet, you've got your sort of basic groups of assets. You've got your cash, Account receivable, so if you're selling on credit, you expect to see account receivable. Okay? You've got inventory if you're in the business of buying and selling goods. You've got prepaid expenses. Okay, prepaid expenses, even though it's got the word expense in there, it's an asset. It seems counterintuitive, but it's an asset. The reason, again, go back to your basics. If you're prepaying something, right, let's say you're, you're prepaying, uh, what would you prepay? Insurance, right, for the year. Or two years. Let's say you pay you prepay insurance for two years. Okay, let's say a year. Let's speak it simple. You prepay insurance for a year. At the beginning of the year, you pay twelve hundred dollars. Now it's an asset because you get to be insured for the twelve month period. It's an asset. It gives rise to a future benefit. I always think of assets equals future benefit, right? So it gives you a coverage of twelve months. As you go through each month, that portion that you use up of that insurance becomes expense. Assets become expenses, right? It's just a question of when. So prepaid expenses fall into that category. Prepaid expenses, you're prepaying up front and you're der deriving benefit from it over a period of time. As you consume that benefit, that portion that you consume becomes an expense. Um, property plans and equipment, obviously an asset. Intangible assets, the next one, this is very tricky. This is where a lot of and this is, okay, putting my FASB hat on, it's hard to put uh, a number around intangible assets and allow companies to record intangible assets on the balance sheet, okay? 
In fact, you're not really allowed to unless you buy it, right? But here, you're in a startup. You're trying to put together a business plan. And we know that, you know, you, you may have some uh, core competencies. You may have a great team. You may have, you may, and you may view your employees or the people that you're working with as assets. And rightly so. But from an accounting perspective, you should try not to put them on the balance sheet. I mean, you could, but an investor is going to say, okay, you know, you have to really justify why you're putting that on the balance sheet. Now, this may be different if, let's say, if you are on, you know, if you are in, if your business uh, is on the web and you buy a customer list, and you know the customer list is, a, is an asset, right? Okay, let's say you pay five thousand dollars for this customer list, and in fact. The customer list is worth twenty thousand dollars to you, but the fact is, you went out, you pay five thousand dollars for this customer list. On a conservative basis, you can put the five thousand dollars as an intangible asset on your balance sheet. Why? Because you can prove that you bought this asset, even though in your mind you think it's worth twenty thousand dollars to your business because it's very valuable. The fact is, a transaction happened. You pay five thousand dollars for it. That's the the voice that you really should put on your balance sheet, not what you secretly think it's worth. Okay? So intangible assets is a bit tricky. Okay? Um, if you go out and you pay for an intangible asset like a customer list or uh, you, you know you, you, you some, something else that you buy that is, is more of an intangible nature, then you can put that on your balance sheet. But if you didn't, then you shouldn't really put that on your balance sheet. So big conservative. Yeah. As a, as a startup, should you put an intellectual property in the intangible asset? Uh, what do you mean by intellectual property? Okay. Um, yes. Because if, if it costs you, um, although let's say, you know, if it, if it costs you to, to patent something, or it costs you, uh, and, and that whatever cost is that you incur, uh, that's the sort of the minimum, the, the most that you really should put in, not the sort of the full value of that. From an accounting perspective, okay, you won't All right, um, liabilities, sort of your basic liabilities, accounts payable, going to the bank, going to your family and friends, and you've got your equity, which is your um, the owner's interest in, in business. Um, uh, basically, this, this regurgitates what I said before, so I'm not going to go through this, tying the financials together. Um, this provides more detail, a lot of detail, right? Uh, uh, and too much for me to go into today. But to answer some of your questions before, how do we come up with these sales forecasts? Again, these are detailed assumptions that um, you know we're looking for in the business plan. Okay, sales per customer, number of customer sales, growth rates. The next sort of big thing I want to talk about um, in the spreadsheet that I, I have um, is um, the break-even analysis. How many people here have done break-even analysis or come forward with it? So break-even analysis is very simple. Okay, it's it's you, you, a couple of key things you need to think about. What are your fixed costs? That's the most important thing. Let's say your fixed cost is a hundred thousand dollars, right? And it's fixed because that's how much you have to incur, regardless of how much you sell. It's fixed. Break-even analysis. The purpose of break-even analysis is to help you think how many th how many products or how many units do I have to sell to cover my fixed costs. That's what break even analysis is. It's as simple as that. Okay? Remember, fixed costs are fixed. You can't do anything about them. That's what you have to incur. So, break even analysis helps you figure out how many units you have to sell in order to cover your fixed costs. Then, the next part of break even analysis, you need to think about okay, it, we have to try and figure out how many units I have to sell to, to cover my fixed costs. Then, you need to think about well, what's the sales price per unit? Right? What's the sales price per unit and what was the cost of each unit? Sales price and cost of goods sold per unit, right? So with in this very simple example, you've got a, the sales price per unit is $75. Um, and let's say your cost of goods sold is 30 is half of that, $37.50. So what's your gross profit? The gross profit is basically the direct profit from buying and selling that unit. Now, here I've used a very simple example. It's a retail, and you know, 
business, you buy inventory, you sell inventory. If you're producing the inventory, then you need to further break down, right? You've got here, for example, you've got the raw materials, um, and you've got your direct labor, etc. Right? So it gets more complicated when you're making the product. But let's keep it simple. Retail company. You buy products, you sell products. In this example, you're selling <coughs> 75 and it costs you a product $37.50. So your profit margin, your contribution margin is $37.50. Okay. So that's the profit purely from buying and selling that inventory. Now let's bring back in to the picture fixed costs. You do analysis of your fixed costs, you have your total fixed cost being $41,450. So now you say, okay, I make, from every sale, I make a profit of $37.50. But my total expenses, my fixed costs, are $41,450. If I sell nothing, I still incur an expense of $41,450. If I sell a million products, or not a million, but you know, hundreds of thousands of products, I still incur $41,450. That's what we mean by fixed. So then you have to figure out what your break-even um, break uh, sales level. This is the magic number that we're trying to get at. So to calculate that, you say, okay, you can see from the formula here, you've got your fixed costs divided by your profit per unit. That's as simple as it gets. Whatever your fixed cost is divided by the profit per unit will give you the total units that you have to sell to cover that fixed cost. So you might want to do a sensitivity analysis. Worst case scenario, best case scenario, right? and um, middle case scenario. So the worst case scenario is you've got really high fixed costs. Your best case scenario is you may have lower fixed costs, okay, and you may be able to increase the sales price a little bit, or, you know, there are different ways to mix those different variables around, right? So you might, but you want to keep it constant, right? So that's, let's focus on fixed costs. Worst case scenario, you've got really high fixed costs, Best case scenario, you may be able to shave off some of your fixed costs. Your middle or you know, realistic scenario is where your fixed costs fall somewhere in between. And then you have your break-even levels across the different scenarios. Okay, um, I've thrown a lot at you tonight, so um, you know, these, I, I'll, I'll post the slides, I'll get this to post the slides up so you'll have the materials here. Are there any sort of questions? Um, for a business that's entirely cash-based, I'm still a little prey on how the income statement and cash flow statement are going to be, it's going to be different if, at all. If your cash, if, if you're purely working in cash, then your income statement is pretty much going to look exactly like the same. So, in a business plan, if that's pretty much like 95% they're going to look exactly the same. You really have to put both in. Then in that case, probably not. Okay. If, if you're purely selling, uh, it's cash sales and you're paying cash to your suppliers or however you, you know, then, yeah. Okay. It's your statement of cash flows. So which, should you label it income statement and statement of cash flows as the same well, chart? here's the thing. If you, and again, if in your business um, you you have to you know if you if you have to buy a computer you have to buy some you know some heavy you know machinery equipment whatever then if you only use presenting a statement of cash flows then it's going to make your business look really bad because okay. you're expending your, your cash is going out to buy your computers and all the startup no. capital that's why I think it's it's, it's not going to look exactly the same your income statement and statement of cash flows because your income statement those, the cash that you pay to buy a computer and equipment, from an income statement point of view, the expenses you can spread out over a number of periods, a number of months, a number of years. So if you're putting major expenses like equipment or computers and things like that into your startup investment capital, yeah. and then you're doing a monthly income statement for first year, second year, third year, then you can should you 
and not, but wouldn't you have to take it out of your startup capital to then be depreciating it over your income statements? Right. So you have. So when you think of startup capital, so think of it as an asset, right? So you so you have your balance sheet, and then yeah. So a portion your 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 assets will go down each period because you are depreciating them, but your expenses would be recorded each period. As you as your assets go down, you are recording expenses each period. So that's why I think it's useful to have an income statement, but if you don't have any sort of computers or if you don't have any assets basically, then you're working with basically statement of, you know, statement of cash. If you don't have, if you're purely, if you don't, if purely cash, no assets, then your balance sheet is still comprised of cash. There's no computer, no other assets. You will have no accounts payable, no liabilities, right? Um, you may have a loan where you put the borrowed cash from someone, right? But you pretty much have cash. It's a boring balance sheet. Cash and a loan from bank, and then you have your owner's equity, and that's it. That's as simple as it gets. But I doubt that your business will just have that. Okay. Or it's possible. But, yeah. Uh, yep, question? Sure. This is my implementing. You talk about contribution margin. And is that interchangeable with net profit? No. The contribution margin is literally, think of contribution margin as gross profit. It's the profit of purely buying and selling the inventory. It doesn't take into account any other expenses. It's the, the price per unit that you sell and the cost of that unit that you that you incur. Basic example of the textbook. You bought some textbook from a from a uh, you know from a student, ten dollars to sell for fifteen dollars. Cost of sales ten, sales price fifteen, contribution margin there is five dollars. Doesn't take into account your wages, doesn't take into account you renting a space to store the books, doesn't take into account any of that. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well um, good luck with your business plans and um, and I guess um, uh, just keep going back to the website. Uh, this probably has the dates on the key, the critical dates on the website for when the business plans are due. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, just keep going back to the website.